Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us tonight. We have another edition, HR Mentorship Learning Series. We don't get tired of learning. Today, our speaker is Mr. Larry Ojolo, and the topic we'll be looking at is alignment of HR value chain to business goals. Mr. Larry Ojolo is not a fault. It is my privilege and honor to introduce him very briefly. He has a BA honors from the University of Adwekiti. He also has a master's of managerial psychology from University of Lagos. He is a full member of the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management of Nigeria. And I'll just say a few things about his work experience. He has diverse work experience that ranges from consulting, financial services, insurance, and oil and gas. At the moment, is the learning and development specialist at Sanlem, Nigeria. Proud to now, he was the HR business partner at AOS OL Limited. Before then, he was an HR generalist at Royal Exchange PLC. And even much earlier, he was the HR, he was an HR consultant at Mastermind HRSG Consulting Lagos with excitement, delight, and gladness. Please let's receive to the virtual load podium. Mr. Larry Ojolo, as it teaches us on alignment of HR value chain to the business goals. Over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Once again, good evening, and I want to appreciate the privilege by Mr. Yemi Adi Oshun uh, for having me once again to, for us to have this conversation. For me, I, I want to believe it's a great time of learning. Personally, for me, I'm here to also learn. And I want to believe every one of us on this call, we are here to learn tonight. I want to assure you that it's going to be a great time of learning. Uh, let me again apologize for coming behind schedule because of network. Um, you know, the glitch is here and there. Uh, but finally, I'm here. So we are going to go straight into the business. Uh, like he said, I want to also use this opportunity. Before I go into that, I want to appreciate uh, the platform that uh, Mr. Yemi has created for every one of us to learn. I've been to the recorded sessions, YouTube, to see some uh, recorded uh, sessions from uh, the previous times. I think this has started over a year, if I'm not mistaken, now, and a whole lot of videos on business, on HR activities that one can sit down and learn from professionals. So we want to appreciate you, sir for coming up with this initiative, the HR Mentorship Group, which is a WhatsApp group. We have professionals on the group. And not only that, by putting up this particular platform, it's, it's a knowledge management system, like we discussed the last time when we had uh, that particular session that I facilitated. So again, today, we are going to look at how we align HR um, value chain to, to business goals. Basically, we'll be talking about HR, and we'll also be talking about business goals and we are going to uh also have conversation i also encourage every one of us to make contributions so i want to welcome you wherever you are joining us from from nigeria from uk from canada this of america and as many that will still see this video after now on youtube uh, there's a time to learn even if you cannot participate in the in the live session when you are seeing this video, you can as well make your comment. We'll be seeing them and we'll be reacting to your, to your comment. This is the agenda uh, introduction. Mr. DME, uh, Ms. Oluyemi Adioshun has done that for us. We'll be looking at main people risk types that face business. We are going to look at the type of risk that face business, both internal, both internal and external risk. We're going to be looking, talking about strategy alignment. How do we align the value chain? Then we'll also talk about what is uh, HR value chain, so to speak. What, what does this value chain mean? And uh, the importance of human resources uh, function, the business strategy, we'll be looking at alignment pyramid. We'll also look a test to see uh, the value that we are bringing as social professional to the table. We also look at something very uh, practical, the gain print ratio. We also look at what can we use to ascertain whether as HR professionals, we are making maximum contribution to the business. We look at improving employee performance, which is central for me 
HR uh, environment. So we also discuss some life functions and see how we can as well merge all of this together to make our businesses, businesses in Nigeria, in Africa, and all over the world, uh, a better uh, place, a better organization, business that makes and achieves their goals. And without wasting much time, we'll, I want us to start, we've talked about my profile, that's me, we can also, let's follow on LinkedIn, Mr. DME is very active, highly active on LinkedIn. I, I am I am just following. I at times I wonder how he copes with all these activities. Maybe I should come and sit down with you and do a mentoring session with you so that you help me to cope with all of these activities on your desk. Sir. Uh we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about alignment of HR value chain. So what do we mean? Let me break it down. I remember the first time I heard about value chain. I it was during the agri uh agricultural session i think it was in on the farm i mean on the farm not even in a class i say it was a value chain and you know when we talk about value chain of a product like cassava from that point that it's harvested when you get the fruit you can use the product for gary you can use it for uh some other fufu some other things that can be done at a point there is technology has made it possible for us to make kerosene from cassava and so many things. And not only that, the waste that we get from that cassava uh, product, from the farm product, that particular waste, they use it to feed, uh, they, they make use of it in the husbandry. I mean, part of agriculture as well. You can feed your animals with the waste that comes from it and so many other things. So I, I, I grew up to understand that from a particular product that you have, you can have a value chain that does so many things. One critical example is what we call the crude. From crude, when it's exploited, it goes through a process, a process of refining that particular product. That product can bring as many as other products, kerosene, diesel, the PMS that we use every day. So you discover several other products can be derived from one particular product. And that is where I want us to start uh, this conversation this evening from. If you take a look, if you take a sample of organizations in Nigeria, most of the medium-sized organizations, they don't understand the kind of value chain, the kind of value that they can derive from HR to move their business forward, to upscale their business. And that is essentially what we want to do. Let's say on this call this evening, you are not an HR professional, but you are a business person. We'll be speaking to you to say, these are the things that you can use HR to do in your business, to move your business from where it is today to where it is expected, your targeted end that you have laid down for the business. And that's essentially what this alignment is all about. How can we ensure that the HR processes is streamlined to achieve business goals? And that is essentially what we'll be talking about on this particular uh, conversation this evening. First and foremost, let's discuss main people risk types that face a business. I want us to, to, to begin this conversation in the chat box. I want you to please... Um, go into the chat box. I want to see your responses in the chat box. What are the people risk types that face business? In your business, if it's not your personal business, if your organization, you as an employee, what are the people risk types that face your business? I need someone to join me in the chat box. I need responses. I want to be sure I am not the only one on this call this evening. So what are the risks that you face? What are the risks? What are the people risks that we face? People risks that we face in our businesses. I'm still waiting. I need to have contributions from us. I am, I am, I'm sure that we have risks that we face. Thank you to see a lot into you says on productivity. Fantastic. It's a serious risk because you have employees who are collecting salary and the business is not making profits. It's a huge risk in Nigeria today 
so many of our businesses, even some of the multinationals, they are not they are not making profits. They are not on the path of profitability, and employees are still being paid. Abiodo says burnout. Yes, burnout. People are burnout. Uh, things affect affecting them outside the organization. Wow, redundancy, adequacy, redundancy. Thank you for the contribution. Let's keep them coming. Lack of expertise. Yes, lack of expertise. Yes, Victoria says employee misconduct. Misconduct from the employees. Those are risks. Those are risks. Such risks, like uh, Victoria Bimbola noted, people misconduct can affect the business. You can remember during Easter, uh, some company I won't mention them, so I won't be debranding a particular brand. In fact, not just now, in December, some activities went on social media. They started dragging, dragging a brand because uh, some of the employees didn't do what is expected of them. Misconduct. They didn't do the normal thing. Mismanagement of forms. Wow. Those are risk. People risk that organization face. Ski gaps. Thank you, my guys. Say gaps is that a serious risk? There is a huge gap in skills uh, development, depth. Adekoya, yes. Adekoya, uh, look me. I don't understand how depths are people risk. Yes, we have risk, but people risk lack of time management. Wow, I'm we I've been waiting for this employee turnover. The Japa, I'm surprised nobody is talking about Japa. Thank you, Oluchi, for bringing this up employee turnover. It's a huge risk. It's a huge risk. Lack of motivation. Nikari, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your contribution. You can still continue to drop your contributions into the chat box. So main people risk types. We are going to discuss this with regards to people. Then we will be talking about risk that business face in Nigeria, in Africa, and all over the world at this moment. Now, let's talk about the people risk here. Yeah. People risk types, I categorize them basically into about four, sorry, five, five of them. Talent management, uh, employee benefits, training and development, compliance, workplace safety. All of these are people risk. And virtually everything that we have said falls under one category or the other. For instance, if you talk about the employee turnover, it's under talent management. How do we ensure that we retain talent within the organization? How do we ensure that uh, the JAPA syndrome is not affecting the business, the achievement of the business goals is a huge risk and it's under talent management. And you know when you're talking about talent management, it has a process from attraction even to the exit, the attraction, the selection, the developing, the, the managing of the performance all fall under this. And including the benefits also fall under this, the compensation. The training and development is a huge risk when you are talking about the skills gap. How are we going to be able to manage all of these risks? The best way to manage this is to, is to be proactive. So for any business, they need to be proactive. And one aspect that is a risk to business is compliance and workplace safety. Aside all of these business risks that I've highlighted, and some of us, we have also made mention of uh, in the chat box where we contributed, Oh, sorry, I'm seeing them, some comments in the chat box. So aside all of this, what are the other risks that business, businesses, organizations face in Nigeria that affect them in the attainment of business goals? I want us to go into the chat box now. So I want to see what are the risks. If you, if you have your personal business, what are the risks, both internal and external, we talk about mostly what we've discussed so far is about external internal risk. I want us to talk about external risk that affect businesses in Nigeria, in Africa, and all over the world. What are the risks that affect businesses? I want to see your comments in the chat box. And if you are seeing this video after now, I want you 
So please make comments on the risk that affects your business. We'll be responding. Mr. DME, myself, I'll be following to see. I'll be turning on the notification. Thank you. All of you says government policies, government policies, economic policies. Yes, most of us are saying government policies, government policies, government policies. Wow. Lack of skilled resources. Up there, lack of skilled resources. Thank you, Ma. Uh, Mrs. Fumi Balogun, thank you. Government policy, majority of us, devaluation of Naira. That's monetary policy. Thank you, Abiyo Donaldi Miji, for narrowing this down to the monetary policy of this present administration, the pandemics. The pandemics also affected it. Thank you, blessing. Competition, Olushola, thank you for that contribution. All of these, let's keep them coming. Insurgency, insecurity, thank you, blessing. Those are external risks. Uh, inflation is also affecting it. Thank you. Thank you. Then iPhone, I don't know that name, uh, says leadership star. And Lagos State's ministry, wow, says uh, political instability. Yes, yes, yes. Probably in this climb, uh, it, it has been stable in Nigeria for the past, for over 20 years, since 1999, in other crimes, I might not know, but since I'm seeing Lagos State government, and in fact, in Lagos State, the uh, political uh, arena has been stable. I mean, transition from one democratic government to another. So uh, I, I don't know, probably you might want to make a clarification on that particular contribution. But but this is PR, having to settle multiple people. Wow, wow, speaking to corruption. Labor union and trade union activities, they are also affecting, they are affecting all our activities. Oh, thank you for those wonderful contributions. I love this. If you have more, please drop your comment in the chat, but these are all the risks that affect. There's a particular risk from, yes, Shola, technology, technological risk, multiple taxations. I'm trying to ensure I don't miss any of the contributions in the, Chat boss. Victoria says, K horse. People losing their businesses to hoodlums and talks. I'm robbery activities, vandalization, crisis, insecurities. These are all risks that will have that affect businesses, credit customers not paying up in, on time. Those are all risks. Thank you for the wonderful contribution. Now, we have mentioned all of these risks. Remember, what we are discussing is how do we align? How do we align people to business goals? Having known that we have all this risk on our hands in our businesses, how do we ensure that we manage these things? For instance, some of the external risk, we might not be able to manage them. We might not be able, but we can make adequate plans. We can be proactive. You can be proactive when it comes to the... Uh, government policies that the first set of people that commented mentioned government policy government policy government policies you may not have a control so we need to first of all know that there are risks that are within our control as hr people as business leaders and there are also risks that are not within our control risk we can control and risk we cannot control but for the ones that we cannot even control we need to put measures in place to mitigate those risks and how do we put measures in place to mitigate those risks that's talking about the alignment of people to business goals when you have correct people when you have effective people when you ensure that you have people in the organization who are proactive, who take up responsibility, they will be able to mitigate the kind of the risk that are not even within our country. They can put measures in place. They can put come up with business plan that will ensure that those risks do not negatively affect the achievement of overall business goals. And more importantly, we also be looking at the internal risk that we can control. For all of these risks, to all of these risks, we can actually control those ones that are internal. So taking a look away from this risk, let's dive straight into how do we now ensure that as HR people, we, 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 we ensure that these risks are mitigated, that the people risks 
the internal and external risks, the ones that we cannot control, how do we ensure that they don't affect the achievement of business goals? Now, let's look at this. This is from Gartner. They call it strategy alignment. For every business strategy, there should be a, a, a point where every business has its own strategy. I had a session sometimes, and I say, strategy is simply what makes you different from others. Let's put it that way. Don't let us be um, academic too much. I don't want to be academic about this. Your business strategy is what makes you different from others. That's what differentiates you in the marketplace. So when that is settled, we, we must, first of all, create a people strategy that maximizes performance. Take note, people, maximization of performance. We'll be taking a look at all of these. Then the section two, you are expected to execute. Number two thing is the execute people strategy. And when you continue to align this people strategy, there is what we call that is the central, which is at the central of all of this alignment is partnering with the business. Partnering, 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 partnering with the business cannot be overemphasized. So first of all, you create a people strategy. All the risk, you call it fraud, you call it government policies, you call it inflation within the business, outside the business, those risks that you can control within the business, those risks that you, you cannot control, you need to create a people strategy and execute this strategy. And while you maintain continuous alignment, what you'll be doing, in essence, is that you are practically partnering with the business. You, so you have a situation whereby the people who are in the business, the people who makes up the business are partnering. So in other words, we can say we can have people in an organization, in a business who are not interested in the success of such an organization. Hello, someone is saying something? Please go on, sir. All right, sir. So we have people who are in organizations. Now, let me start a, a typical example. There is a particular statement, permit me to say it in Yoruba we interpret. For as many of us that are not um, Yoruba speakers, you say, Ogota, Ogota, Owala Ruakwe. There's some of us that will believe mm, whether the company is making profit, or whether the company is not doing well, look, my salary will come at the end of the month. In such an organization, when you have people whose mindset is such a mindset. They are not partnering with the business to ensure that the business succeeds. Look at it. Someone mentioned one of the risks, fraud, as one of the risks that affect business. When you see in organizations, when people are trying to make money at, at the detriment of the success and the achievement of every organization, they are not in that business to partner with the business to ensure that that business succeeds. What they are doing is to partner to defraud the business. And it's so unfortunate that we have HR people, business leaders who are not, who don't understand how to ensure that such do not happen within the business. So what we are discussing is how do we ensure that we have people within an organization who partner to ensure the success of such organizations. And that is the essence of aligning the HR value chain. Forget about that big grammar, HR value chain. Aligning people, let's put it that way. Align people, aligning people to the achievement of goals. So you have people at every level, be it drivers, be it cleaners, be it marketers, be it backend staff, be it the leaders who are working. They are all working. Let me set an example. Uh, in, in some of the companies I've consulted, I've seen leaders, leaders, the money that is expected, the revenue that is expected to come into the organization, they divert into a personal business. It's happening. It is because the right strategy, people's strategy is not in place. When such strategy is in place, people will partner, people will put their, their resources, their time, their goals. How do we ensure all of this.
how do we ensure there is alignment that we don't have people who are working against our organizations that we don't have people who are working to ensure that the organization goes down you heard about silicon valley it's a people issue and you see organization that goes down that's having a problem is a people issue is a people problem is a people issue within organization and until business leaders understand that that people's strategy matters to the success of the business strategy. They will continue to make errors. They will continue to make mistakes. And that is why this is essential. For every one of us, even if you are not HR persons on this call, you are not an HR professional, this is essential because if you have correct and effective people's strategy in place, it is, you are 90% sure that you're on the path to success. So, Let's come back a little bit to talk about HR. I'm not going to be talking about HR because I'm aware that some of us on this call, we are not core HR people. We are business oriented people, but for every business, that's why if you look at this slide at this moment, I'm not putting so many activities when it comes to, when it comes to uh, HR, we have some other things, but let's limit it to every business. You need to recruit the right people. That's the first thing. You need to engage the people. Disengage employees will frustrate the goals of any organization. But unfortunately, leaders in across different organizations, they believe employee engagement is just another thing. My uncle posted something, Mr. Lee, uh, Mr. posted something of prison that uh, M. Young mentioned him, said, uh, during his own time, it was work ethics and it's not work balance. Please, we can go and research the organization and, and look at how they are doing, looking at their people and look at some of the risks that are affecting them. I have not done that, but that's a wrong perspective because it has changed. It's no more work ethics. You have to look about work life balance. And this comes under employee engagement. Performance management is another key. If you cannot track the performance of the people that are coming to the business, remember we started from recruiting, getting the right people. How do we ensure that we get the right people into our business? Then paying them fairly. That's another thing after performance management. Recruiting, getting the right people, getting them engaged, managing their performance, ensure that they come up to speed with what is expected of them, then paying them correctly. At times when you see post recruitment on social media, you see some posts and they're asking for chartered accountants, for instance, the chartered accountant of 25 years experience, and they put the salary expectation is 300K. You wonder how come they want a chartered accountant of 15, 20 years and they are ready to pay 300,000 naira. That means that they are not still getting it. What, they, what that particular business needs is not a chartered accountant. They need a graduate account officer who will be able to sit down and do some of the works. So until an organization gets its compensation philosophy right, and understand that even though I want a chartered accountant, I cannot afford it. I need to go to where I will be able, what I am, what I'm, the revenue that is coming into the system, I can afford. And you will discover that if care is not taken, yes, you will eventually see chartered accountants who will come, but they will not stay. That will lead us to another aspect of staying, managing them to stay. And another thing is, how do we ensure like one of the risks that we mentioned is skills gap. How do we ensure we train? How we, we develop the capacity of people within a business to achieve the business goals? And critical, very critical, though it's not core of it, is compliance. HR is responsible for ensuring that the organization complies with labor laws and regulations, including laws related to hiring, equal uh, employment opportunity, workplace safety, employee privacy. The data privacy law in Nigeria is taking the whole lot of shape that things are changing. You cannot just afford not to comply with the rules. These are all important functions, but remember, these are not limited functions, but these are core for even the business is starting to be, even if, you are starting a business today. If it's a one-man consulting firm and you want to get another place, you must have all this. How do you get people to join the business? How do you engage people? And without wasting time, I want us to take a look away from business strategy and HR versus. Now, I want to see comments in the chat box again. 
I want I want us to go to the chat box. Uh, uh, I, I'm seeing the comments on the last uh, conversation issue that we, was raised. Business strategy versus HR value chain. I want to ask this question. Why is it that most of the time, most organizations, the business strategy and HR is all is not always the same. HR is thinking about this, the business is thinking about this. Why? Why is it so? Why do we think it's like this? Why businesses they are thinking about how to scale up, they want to do an expansion, and HR is saying the proposal that there's going to be a training, and the leader of the department now says no. We are doing we are doing a product launch on this particular day will not be available. Why do we think so? Why why do we have such controversies? And I'm sure we have HR people in the house. Please tell me why do we normally have business strategies always fighting, always colluding with HR activities? I want to see your comments in the chat box. Lack of communication, chairman, from management and misalignment. There is no proper communication. Thank you for that contrib contribution. Thank you, ma. It says, uh, Mrs. Fumi Balogu says, it should not be. All departments must align to the business. Yes. Thank you. There is no collaboration between the teams involved. Thank you. Charles says, there is lack of confidence because environmental objectives does not align. Well, fine. Thank you. Thank you, lack of clear goals. Thank you. So it might be that organization strategy was not defined. Yes, some organizations they don't, they don't have a strategy. So we must ensure wherever organization that we find ourselves, one of the things that I'm taking away also is that if you find yourself in an organization, they don't have a strategy, sit down with the leader and say, oh, oh, my boss, let's have where we are going. If you if the business doesn't have where the business is going, there will be misalignment. So we must ensure that there is no misalignment, no interaction. Yes, thank you. There is no collaboration. There is no discussion. Someone mentioned lack of effective communication. One of the things that business strategy and HR, why they quarrel most times is because there is no engagement. What do you want? Head of product development, what, how can you support? How can we support you? How can we ensure that we support this business? Thank you, Oluchi, because no communication between HR department and the C-suite. There is no communication. Most of the time, we are just running with people agenda. We are just running, we are just running, and there is, there is misalignment. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't. Our business strategy and HR activities should not be fighting. They should not be in the boss way. Then we say, no, we will do this, or no, 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 no. There must be the those activities must be in an agreement. They must be aligned. And how do we ensure that all HR activities, people related activities, are aligned to the business? How? 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 So that's where we'll be going in. I call it alignment pyramid. If if after now I'm not be able to tell you the issue of alignment pyramid when it comes to the history from Egypt and what have you. But on the left-hand side, you will see what the business strategy is, what the HR value chain, which is, you can you can call it uh, business, uh, sorry, effective people-related activities. The first thing is initial process. Do we have a process in place for your recruitment? For instance, any recruitment must have a job description that we are bringing this particular person. What is going to be the job? What is this person going to be doing? That's going to be doing for the business. What's going to be the roles and responsibilities of this particular role? What's the KPI? That's the initial process. Then committed process, that's the level two. We must be committed to the process. We must have HR professional who knows what the process entails from end to end when it comes to recruitment, when it comes to performance management, when it comes to employee engagement, end to end of that process. We must be committed to it and say, this is what it requires. What This is what the law says. When it comes to compensation, oh, the law says that you must pay tax. You must do PFP. You must do uh, ITF deductions. All of this, law, we must be committed to it and we must establish a process. And 
after establishing that process for any business, it must be improved. And if it is improved, then most of the time you discover that for HR people, what we do is just to put the process and put it on paper and we put it, we don't review it. Like in my organization, what we do is so every two years we review all our policies. This year, we have reviewed our SOP to say, these are processes for recruitment. Is it really meeting the business? Is it really working? We said, oh, eight weeks to, 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 to fill every vacant role after approval, eight weeks. But are, are we able, are there complaints from uh, the IT team, the solutions department team, the product team? How have we been able to support them? Can we increase or we reduce? We need to induce, reduce the number of ways that we are doing. That is optimization. Now, all of the five steps under this alignment pyramid must be speaking, must be tied to the business strategy. So, for instance, if the business says, oh, we want to increase our revenue from 100 million naira by December 2022 to 200 million naira by December 2023. At the moment, how many people that do we have that are uh, income generating staff? Do we need to increase the number of employees? Now, if we have only five employees who are income generating revenue, um, income uh, revenue, bringing gener uh, generating revenue to the company, and their target, they were able to make 100 million, if we increase it by two, are we going to be able to make this? Okay, what can we do? Even if we are not going to increase. Oh, is it that if we can increase the pay of our people, they will be able to put in all effort. You will discover that all of these conversations, we need to have them to initiate a process, to be committed the process. But one thing that is critical to this alignment is there is an engagement. We start from somewhere and we begin to engage and begin to engage and engage and engage at every level. When we establish that we want to recruit, not that, oh, at the beginning of the year, we got approval that we're going to recruit 10 people, additional 10 sales people, and they shall, they shall begin to rock that without looking back. When it wants to establish that particular process, without looking back to say, head of uh, sales department, we said 10 people at the, at the beginning of the year. How many people you might discover by March or by April as we are speaking, the business might be saying we might not need 10 people again. Because what we discovered was that when we started this year, we did a performance bonus for some of our people, and we increased their pay by five percent to take care of cola, and their performance has increased. We are asked that discussion is having is taking place at the departmental level and with the leaders of the company, but HR is still running with we must recruit 10 people by the end of December and they are putting adverts. And that's why you discover that there, there are so many adverts outside, there are so many recruitment activities going outside, and people are complaining. HR people, they are not giving us feedback because they've not been able to ascertain initially that this process must take place. So for every process, every people-related process, it must be aligned. There must be communication. There must be engagement. That is how to align so that at the end of the day, when we get to the level five of optimization, we align the business strategy and the HR value chain. They are speaking the same language. They are coming to the same end. That is the end. Then we go straight because of time. Time is really, really running fast. How do we do this test? I wrote about five questions here that you can test the kind of people-related activities, the HR value chain that we've talked about. Remember, five major ones that we talk about, recruitment, employee engagement, training and development, uh, composition, performance management, five of them. They are not limited to all of these five. We have others that are not included, but take notes. For every business, you need this five. What is the main objective of this? Well, that's the first test. If any HR initiative, any HR activities, people-related activities, you cannot identify the main objective of having this particular project, then you should strike it out. Will this initiative enhance the achievement of the, of the organization goals? Most of the time, we don't ask this question to test, to align all the activities to the business goals. If you want to align all HR activities, people-related activities, you need to ask this question. 
this particular initiative, oh, you want to do International Women's Day, for instance, every organization is doing it, by the way. Yes, it's good. It's a good idea. It's a fantastic idea. We want to celebrate all our women. Will this initiative enhance the achievement of the organizational goals? Let's ask that questions. Yes. At the end of the day, we should be able to say, yes, it will. And if it is not, it has not passed an alignment test. And you know, if you are driving, for instance, as many of us that drive, it just come to me now. It occurs to me now that when you are driving and your car is not properly aligned, oh man, he, that could foment a whole lot of trouble. I go to the next question. What would be the long-term return on investment of the process on the bottom line? Yes, the actual return on investment might not be in Naira and Kobo, in dollars, but we can put it down. It can be qualitative, it can as well be quantitative. The return on investment for every initiative, it must pass at least five of alignment tests. You can ask more tests, alignment tests to align every HR activities to the business. What are the benefits stakeholders will derive from this? One of the stakeholders, the customers, the employees, your vendors, the community that you, you are operating from, CSR, what are the benefits? Yes, not all activities will benefit stakeholders, but eventually, eventually, most activities will lead there. What aspect of the organizational goes with this impact? We should be able to say, if you are doing anything as HR people, people-related activities, there are specific aspects of the vision and the goals of the organization that this particular activity will affect. If all your activity, as all your activities as HR people does not pass 70% of the alignment test, then it does not work it. So that is why we see HR people being frustrated every now and then because they do not conduct this test initially before even bringing out a proposal and say, we have an initiative, we want to optimize all our processes. No, will this impact my organization? What aspects? So let's subject our initiatives, all our processes, all HR activities, people-related activities to these alignment tests. And if they pass, if your activity pass 70% of this alignment test, I can bet it with you. You will get the buy-in of the leadership. You will. You will. Now, quickly, you will say, oh, what is this guy talking about? Look at this particular demonstration here. This is to further explain the alignment test. It is called the gain pain ratio. When the gain that the organization will get from this organization, from any initiative rather, or people-related activities is lesser than the pain that you bring to the organization, or is just there, then it's better not to get involved. For instance, if it will increase revenue, oh, go for it. If you're going to save costs, please go for it. If you're going to develop the capacity of people, go for it. If you're going to save time, go for it. If you're going to make your organization more competitive in the marketplace, if it's going to enhance the brand and reputation of the organization, please go for it. But if it's just a bad wagon, oh, every organization is not implementing the HRS. Is your organization ripe for that? Every organization is not buying e-learning platform. Is your organization ripe for that? Have you sat down to identify the learning culture in the organization? Oh, we just want to try. You know, most times, HR people, they just bring in, you know, this is what I call own, HR ego. We just want to, we just want to try something new so that management will feel that you are doing something new in the business. And we just want to satisfy our ego. No, it's going to bring a pain to the organization. And if the pain is higher than the gain, drop it. That's how to align it. And there are some that is neither gain nor pain. They are just 
inertia. They are just there to spend because he's not even doing nothing. He's not adding to the conversation. He's not taking. It's just good enough. No, just say, oh, good, good, good. The activity is good. No, after some programs, we do feedback form. How's the food? How's everything? Everything is ah, good, good, fantastic. What is the impact to the business? What alternatives do we have? Is this particular activity is going to add any risk? Is it going to is going is it going to reduce the risk or is it going to make the risk to increase? These are methods. These are practical ways that we can use to. You, you might not do it the way I'm doing. Just draw a table. What are we going to get from this? We are going to get this. We are going to get it. On that, on the on the on the right hand side, what are we not going to get? You we'll draw it down. And if what you are going to gain is higher from what you are going to lose. From every HR activity, then it does not worth it. That's the game brain ratio. Now, this is going practical. Most times, HR organizations, we don't actually measure the impact of what we are doing. For instance, a critical metric to measure the value. After you have said, oh, this is what we want to do, you must have strategic goals. And the HR activity that is tied, you remember we, we talked about under alignment pyramid that each HR activity, each people-related activities must be tied to strategic goals. One of the strategic goals that I highlighted is availability of manpower. Availability of manpower. The HR value chain that is tied to that is recruiting, selecting, ensuring that the EVP is enhanced outside, the brand image and key initiative. You want to do digital talent pool, you have a talent community, you want to do graduate training program. Then what is the this is it this is typical of a performance scorecard. But most of the time, you discover that HR people doesn't do this. We only consultate at the micro level. We need to do this at a departmental level to say percentage of close rules. When do we have timelines? What's going to be the area of business impact? So this is critical. The area of business impact is what is going to drive us. We begin to identify, okay, what I've seen so far, when we are doing metrics, critical metrics, when it comes to A-sharp activities, what I've seen so far, we just do uh, the metrics. Time to hire, cost per hire, time to fill. Those ones, yes, fantastic metrics, but they are not really... Ascertain what we should be looking at. Do we have performing employees within the business? If you take a look at the second line, improve employee experience. A higher level of employee, a number of employees who are engaged will ensure that the company will reduce some kind of risk, like fraud, like lack of productivity, like other ones that we have mentioned before. And how do we do that? You do that, you do the activities that you will carry out, employee engagement, you develop, seek approval, implement policy, work-life balance, and some other activities are not I just cited this as few examples because of our time. And what's the target? The target of every engagement initiative should increase productivity. If it's not going to increase productivity, then you should drop it. Another thing is building competent workforce. How do we build? First of all, the activity aligned that is directly tied to this particular is talent development and learning development. Talent development activities carry out job evaluation efforts, exercises for all critical roles, implement competency framework, all of this. This is not, I'm not saying you should use this, but the key things that we must take note is that at the end of the day, there must be area of business impact for this particular third point is competent workforce. We have people who are skillful, do we, ask, do we have expertise within the business who could help the organization to scale up, to upscale, to achieve the business goals? So what we are looking at, we're looking at strategic goals, the HR chain that address these particular business goals, the key initiative that will close the business, the targets, the timeline, and most importantly, the area of business impact. We'll begin to cost home now by saying, one of the key things, and like I said earlier, when HR people they are recruiting, the metrics that we look out for is oh, time to fill, time to cost to pay, uh, cost per hire. What does it cost us? We should go beyond that. We should look at performance. 
performance, productivity. Performance, performance, performance. Productivity, higher productivity, higher, higher productivity. If there's anything like that. And how do we do all of this? Improving employee performance is the main thing, is the main activity that every HR person, even if you are not an HR person on this call, you will still see this video after now, you should concentrate on when people are performing on their jobs, when they are engaged, they will perform. And when they perform, the business goals will be achieved. When they are engaged and when they perform, some of the risk that we identified earlier will be mitigated, will be prevented, and if not reduced drastically. How do we improve employee performance? First of all, I say measuring business performance from a sharp perspective. Most of the time, what we do is to do micro level. We just say employee, everybody feeling and get. We need to do it at the macro level. We need to do the business performance at the departmental level. If you are familiar with the balance worker, it starts from the national goals, break it down to department, break it down to teams, unit, and to individual. At the micro level, then we are we are looking at individual performance, what they are doing. Now, this is what I'm saying. I have been in organizations, I've considered for other organizations that when they are doing at the end of the year appraisal, people are calling 80 over 100, 80 over 100, 80 over 100. Everybody is performing, but the business is not doing well. Can anybody witness that? Have you sorry? Has anybody witnessed that? You are in the business, doing a performance appraisal session, people are doing well, but the organization is not doing well. There's something is wrong. That, that means that the, the model, the framework for managing employee performance is faulty. And we need to address it at the micro level and at the macro level. Micro level at the individual level, at the organization level, we need to manage it at the departmental level. If a department is not doing well, it means that the people in the department is not doing well. The people in the department are not doing well. Rather. If a department is doing well, a department is meeting, it means that the people in the organization are doing, in the department are doing well. So if you have a contract situation that a department is not doing well and the people are doing well, that's a misnomer. That's an anathema. It's an anathema. It is an anathema. So we should manage it at the micro. And this will sum up into the achievement of business goals. When organization, when department within organization, you manage performance, not leaving the performance only to HR. In fact, these days, it is no longer with HR. The line managers are the ones that are expected to manage performance. How do we do that? There must be an effective PMS in place, and it, it, there should be a feedback mechanism. In that PMS, the, the process of having smart goals, a lot of that has been summarized into that, set measurable goals. We should have performance improvement frameworks in place, as well as performance development plan in place. For people who are doing well, there should be development plans to enhance them, to upskill and reskill them. For people who are doing below par, there should be activities to bring them up to par. There should be also, there also should be a, a, a positive work caution then for organization to ensure that all activities are aligned. There should be prioritization of learning and development and maximize job satisfaction. One of the days that you'll be talking about, I, I don't talk about work ethics. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. People have life outside work. I have seen MD of businesses in Nigeria, MDs, CEOs that after work, after they tire, they are nothing. They are no more. It's because they have not maximized their life. So we need to be concerned as HR people, as business leaders, with the people that are working with us. But in final note, I won't be talking about this without first of all talking about the HRBP model. The HRBP model, simply put, is pattern. They have mentioned it when we started with the business strategy, and now we can craft a people-related strategy, people strategy that we align with the business, pattern with the business, pattern with the business. There are several HRBP models outside there. I won't sit there and start to do comparison. We have, we have all of them. Dave is a popular one that you can lay your hands on if you have uh, the opportunity of laying your hands on victory to organizations, please go and read the book. 
There are several models that have been designed, that have been uh, reviewed. They have reviewed that particular model by Dave. We can as well read other ones. But remember, as HRBP, business partners, we are business partners. There are things that are expected of us. We must be a catalyst. We must be a consultant. Not just, we are not here to just fire and hire. We are cautious and change champions. We are expected to be a coach. You know what a coach does? He looks at where the strength is. He looks at the weakness. And if you watch a typical uh, football match, you will see who a coach is. A coach looks at the team, looks at the team, and sees what is wrong with the team, and see how they can maximize. That's the work of the HR. So we have to be a catalyst. We have to be a consultant, a coach, and change champion. We must be interested. We must be proactive. Then... Finally, I said, we must be a coach. Initially, I was, con I was contemplating whether to in include HRBP money. I don't want to go into all of that, but remember the HRBP money, I make a reference that we can go and read that book and others. I, I, I just put this one by Dave, uh, sorry, by Academy to Innovate HR says, the company industry sector, as HR people, we need to understand where the money is coming from. The revenue in the company, what's the business model, where is the money coming from? How can we ensure that we stay on the path of profitability? The business acumen, understanding the business, HR. So partnering with the business and ensuring that all activities, they align, they align with the business goal is the core, is the centrality of what we are discussing. And that speaks to HR. B. At this point, this is where I will be dropping uh, my slides for now. It's time for us to have conversations, other contributions. I will be handing over to Mr. Dioshun, Mr. Yemi Adioshun. Thank you once again for having me. Let's have questions now, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very beautiful. Welcome, that was sir. well done. Very rich. As always, we, we appreciate you. Ladies and gentlemen, please, if you would like to ask a question or if you like to comment specifically to the subject of tonight's conversation, please feel free to raise up your hands so that we can recognize you, give you the floor, and allow you to either ask your questions or share your contributions or from your wealth of experience. If you also prefer to drop your questions in the chat box, that is also well aligned well well aligned i would just like to ask a few questions from my end i put together a few questions that i said i, I will ask you sir uh, the first question i'd like to ask you sir is that how can technology be leveraged to support the alignment of the hr value chain to business goals if at all it can be thank you so much for uh that question yes it can be. I think I mentioned uh, something very close, though not deliberately didn't talk about technology. Uh, HR is, most of the time, we need to understand that technology is a means to an end. Technology is not an end itself. So for me, I believe we must first of all understand what the business is, what the business goes are. What does the business want to achieve? Then if a particular technology is going to help us to achieve that, then we go for it. We identify the gains, we identify the pains, and not just say, oh, because every organization is doing e-learning, now let's go for e-learning. No, it should not be. And we must identify that if we bring in this particular um, digital innovation to the system, how is it going to affect the achievement of business goals? I can tell you, sir, there are several organizations in Nigeria today that are, that are making use, I, can, I won't mention names, I know, that they have their HRI system and they are paying for it and they are not making use of it. They paid for HRS and they want to do payroll. They will still go and do it on exam manually. Then what's the essence? Why are we paying subscription? Why are we wasting money? So the first thing is to be able to identify, do we really need this? 
Remember, my first statement is technology, digital advancement is an end. It's not sorry, it's not an end, it's a means to an end. When we understand that this technology is going to help us to achieve our goals, you go for it. And if not going to help us, why go for what is not going to help? What is what is important is business goals, business goals, achievement of business goals, not digital innovation, not technological advancement, but business goals, business goals, business goals. So if business is going to be enhanced, then you go for it. If it's not going to help the business, my advice is why go for it. Thank you, sir. I, 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 I don't know if I've responded to your question. Yes, yes. I have more questions, but before I go ahead, Oluchi Amuze, you have the floor. You can unmute. I made you post. You can unmute and make your contributions or comments. Hello, Madam Oluchi. Madam Oluchi. Okay, while she's still booting. Okay, I think right. she's talking now. Hello, ma'am. I want to say thank you for this lecture. It really came handy. You're welcome, ma'am. A little bit confusing. Most times when I see job openings and um, you will see, oh, they are looking for a HR business partner. And then sometimes you also see a HR man, a job opening, and then it's a HR manager you are looking for. And it's somehow confusing to me. Like, I believe that every HR should be a business partner. You should be strategic. Yeah. So why is musicians now go? Um, you will see a, a, a an advert, and then you are seeing a HR business partner, and then you are seeing another one HR manager. I see they are not um, together. They are not the same thing. So I want to know the reason why they try to separate a HR manager and a HR business partner. If this is a strategic way for every HR to operate in an organization. All right, ma'am. Thank you for uh, your contribution and as well as your question. Like I said, you know, it's not something that you can force on people. People go their own way. And you have uh, not only HRBP or HR manager, we have several nomenclatures out there. People call different names. But one thing is whether HR manager or HRBP, uh, you we need to understand that we manage people. Uh, there are so many theories that has come. There are so many school of thoughts that have that, that have done pretty well regarding the HRBP model, the HR, and the profession has also emerged. The, the profession has evolved over the years. We also need to be aware of that. So people are free to decide what they go for, whether they want to give it any name. But the most important thing is whether you function as HR manager, you function as HR executive, you function as HR advisor, you function as HR BP, one key thing that we must provide is that we must ensure that we support the business with people activities, people-related activities that are aligned to the business. The people are not in the business to just dine and wine and collect salary and go. They are there to achieve their goals. So I wouldn't really say, oh, this is a model. Every organization will decide a kind of model that works for them. For instance, in the HRBP model, you have the center of excellence, you have the, the, the shared services, and you have the HRBP uh, partnering model. So different organizations with their own business model. So, But first, first and foremost, every leader, every HR person should understand the business and the kind of model that is going to work for them. The organization that they don't need to have HR, BP, HR, three, four, five HR people. They just need one person who will do the work. And at times, they might not even need an HR person. They might just need a, a consultant, like 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 consultant that will just, oh, do this work for them. They are doing payroll if they are see Andy. And the business is just starting from the scratch. So it depends on the business, depends on the kinds of uh, or the kind of uh, the model that business is having and the kind of leaders, what their choice is. So we cannot decide. People have their own options to, to choose what they like. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. We have uh, another question from Mr. Omo Sibo Ozo. Omo, you have the floor, please. I hope I okay. got your gender right. Don't give me no, it's a female, it's not a male. <laughs> oh, my, my bad. Forgive me, please. Not a problem. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Adiyashu. Thank you to our speaker for today. I just wanted to contribute to the question the last um, person had in terms of the HR business partner model. Okay, so people would advertise an HR business partner based on their business model. You have some organizations that are broken down into units. So you require an HR business partner to manage a particular segment of the business. That particular, when you, so when they say an HR business partner, the person is responsible for a segment of that organization, right? So everything um, pertaining to HR that that segment of the business requires, particularly for multinational organizations or organizations that have large number of persons. So you can have an HRBP assigned to, let's say, the accounting unit, and you are the only one with the director in charge of that unit that would plan everything HR for that business segment. That HRBP then reports to an HR manager or to a director, depending on the structure of that organization. So for that reason, you have people advertise different nomenclature for the HR role, right? For some people, they just used to use that nomenclature to make you understand that they want somebody to partner with the business. So it's about the business structure, really. That's why they would use that structure. Every HR person is supposed to be a business partner, but the HR, the organizational structure would determine how they use their nomenclature for their organization, how they structure. It's about the structure. Of what that business would look like. And generally, every HR person today is supposed to be part of strategy. Uh, strategy. Thank you. That's what I wanted to. I just wanted to give that clarification for us to understand why those um, rules are advertised in that manner. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for making it clearer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there are some questions on the chat group. Mr. Ojolo, you may want to go through them. In any particular order uh, with priority to questions directly related to tonight's topic. All right, so let me let me go up. I want to remind you that I've not been added to the group. Okay, how can people in the department be doing well? And yes, we have this. Uh, that's for Mogun Remy. Getting a lot of value. I thank you. That's the contribution. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to scroll down so I don't miss any. Okay. Let's say contribution. This is from Galaxy S9. Please, you can change your uh, name so that we know uh, the personality behind Galaxy S9. Uh, Oputu, patient says, thank you so much for this session, but we do... How do we improve performance of an employee who keeps underperforming over and over again, causing the organization to lose money and doesn't see mistakes as a big deal? Wow. What steps can be taken to ensure that performance appraisal is productive and not just exercise? Now, some of the things that this particular question for an underperforming employee, there must be what I call performance improvement plan. It must have that conversation. It's not, it's, it's a difficult conversation that must be heard. HR should facilitate that session with the employee and the line manager. We should facilitate that session that you have been performing not really good on this job. We want you to improve. We we'll give you a timeline of six months. It's a difficult conversation, and most employees don't want to have it. When you have that conversation, they already know that there is trouble. Now, if we have that conversation, say six months, we are going to support you. And not a life-threatening conversation, so to speak. HR should ensure and facilitate that such sessions are aired with such an employee and give a timeline. Support should be given. Conversations should be heard to say, what are the reasons? Why are you not meeting your targets? Why are you not performing? Why are you underperforming? And if there are cases, there are exceptional cases that some employees will have family issues, personal challenges, if they're able to come up and they say it, HR should also facilitate how they can support such employees and give them time to improve, to solve their personal problems. But let's say there are no personal problems, there is no issue at all, and the employee just decide not to perform. You give six months and ensure that this is documented and you provide necessary support, necessary capacity development, and after the time that the person is not doing well, 
then everybody, you need to take a decision. The line manager, you need to advise them to take a decision. Take a decision to see we need to, we need to, we need to separate this relationship. Now the relationship can be separated if the employee refuses. But I've seen situations whereby when performance improvement plan is thoroughly implemented, it can make a whole lot of difference in the career of such an employee because they will see reasons why they need to improve and they will see that this conversation is not just threatening their job security, it's helping them to become a better person. I have seen in my current place of work, employees have been transformed by performance improvement plans. But in locations where it has not been productive, there is no other way to eat than to call the shots. Like go to the next question. What steps can be taken to ensure that performance appraisal is productive and not just unnecessary? We identified it. There must be a performance management system in place that has a robust system that sets goals, a robust system that uh, provides feedback mechanism, a robust system that's improved per performance development plans for individuals who are even doing well. How do we continue to do well? How do you support them? The PIP is speaking to people who are below performance, who are not meeting their expectation. All of these processes should also be done to ensure, that as, as well as ensure that the environment is also a good place. If you have a robust and an objective performance management system and it's a toxic environment, it's not going to be productive. It's just be an exercise. Beg your pardon. So people will not perform because not because you don't have a tool in place, but because the environment is not a good environment. The environment is toxic. So we should ensure that learning and development is prioritized. The environment is safe. People are psychologically safe coming to work every day. They know that oh, I am I am fairly and equitably paid, and all of this system. This, this speaks to the entirety of that process, not only about performance management, but a, about the entire process of people management, people management activities within an organization. And how do you do that? Like I said, I repeat myself again, let that be a performance management system where the goals of the organization are considered at the environmental level. And you remember I talked about the micro and the macro individuals should be measured Department should be measured as well as the organizations should also be measured. In fact, most organizations in account department do the financial performance of the organization. So they are measuring it. But at the departmental level, are we measuring it? What's the contribution of corporate affairs uh, department? What's the contribution of human resources department to, to the goals? What's the contribution of facility department to these goals? All of these should come together. And when that is in place, we can ensure that, yes, we have a system and not only that, a right environment should be in place. Okay, there's a question. I think this is from you, sir. Can you give an example of how you have seen the successful alignment of HR evaluation to business goal in a previous organization? How can HR leaders ensure that the HR evaluation is aligned with business goal in a changing business environment where priorities may shift rapidly? Okay, let me respond to the first one. Uh, the, the first one, what I did, what I did, what I did in this particular on my slides is typical of what is being practiced in my organization. For instance, at the beginning of every year, all HR activities, all activities, learning, HRS, engagement, change management, HR audit, every activity of every activity of HR is aligned to the business goals. And my slides, I, I did a particular slide on how you can measure it. That's what we do. We identify these activities. Is I want to close it out. That's a typical example of how it is being done in my current manager. So what I'm saying is not something that I just read the book. It's something that we are practicing at Salam Nigeria. How can they surely that ensure that the HR evaluation is aligned with business goals in a changing business environment where priorities may shift? Yes, you also said this. Looking at the uh, uh, alignment pyramid, Pyramid. At the beginning, you might say, oh, this is what I want to do. But it might shift. Continuous communication, collaboration, and engagement to come back to say, this is what we agreed. Are you still on course? Can we still go ahead? What's, what's the updates? Is there any updates? Is there any change? Do we need to readdress this? For instance, I manage learning and development in my organization. And what we do at the beginning of the year is to identify what we call the individual development plan, IDPs, to identify the gaps. 
We don't identify the gaps in January and just run through the year. No, every quarter, half yearly, we come and say, for prevention, the gaps are changed due to priorities through the changing environment, changing business environment. We need to address it. And you see instances that we say, no, this person doesn't need it again. Let's put in this particular gap and let's close this training. So continuous engagement, collaboration, meeting business leaders, departmental leaders, line managers to say, what do we need to support you better? How can organizations measure uh, the effectiveness of the HR value chain alignment efforts and what metrics should be they be looking at? I did that on that slide. Probably I will see share that slide. You need to identify, I talked about the strategic uh, goal, the initial activities, the initiatives, then most importantly, you have the target where you want to do, what is going to be the timeline should be there. That is like it is typical of a, of, of a smart goal. You know, the smart is more specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. And that's typical of what I have on the, I think on the second to the uh, last slides. We have that metrics, but more importantly, I said, it is not just about measuring the time to hire, what is going to be the impact of this employee on our organization? And after six months and an employee, a new employee joins the organization, coming back to assess, is this a pure, as in purely unidentified recruitment error, or this person has come to destabilize our system? We should be able to do that. And identify the area of impact is critical to the business. I go to the next one. Uh, my is a contribution. Thank you, Uchina. Lately, it is seen that HR professionals are taking the center stage in advising organizations, but because they are seen as a cost center, most times their suggestions are not always taken until when there is crisis. Other business partners believe they know better than HR. What should HR do? HR should speak in the language of the business. One, HR should also come up with data to back up their analysis, their suggestion. Leaders don't want to see stories. They want to hear stories. How is it going to affect our business? What's going to be the area of impact? For instance, if I walk up to uh, the business and say, this is going to increase our revenue. Every business that we ask, the next question they will ask you is how? And your ability to identify this is how? That last year, you had 10 sales people and they brought in 100 million naira, increase this to 5 million naira, double this, add it to their budget. This is going to be the implication. This is the do an analysis, do an analysis of how it's going to affect the business with facts and figures. So our data analytics uh, skills, we come to play here and it is going to affect. But remember, I will still also say that it is not every initiative or every suggestion that the business leader we accept. They have the right to accept and not to accept it. So some they will accept, but if you have a track record of advising business and it's doing well, they want to listen to you more. But if you are the type, what you said yesterday did not work, what you said before yesterday did not work, the idea you brought yesterday did, is not a part of the business. When you are being the next one, they will tell you, no, we cannot even listen to you. But if you are the type that you don't talk too much, that you come with solutions to the business and it's bringing, you know, it's making a lot of sense. They want to listen to you and that's how it works. But remember, not all suggestions will be accepted at the management level. Uh, thank you, Uchena, for that contribution. Chico say, Kichiko, wow, this is uh, fantastic. Chico say, I didn't know that you're here. The world of work has evolved post COVID. A lot of companies have embraced remote working and improved work life balance. What will you do if you have a line manager who believes his subordinate do not need remote working because he believes they won't meet their targets? Uh, in such a case, I think. Uh, it, 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 that, that requires a whole lot of activities, a whole lot of engagement, and like I said, a whole lot of part. But nevertheless, not all rules, we should also understand that not all rules can work remotely. There are organizations that they cannot work remotely because of the kind of business that they run. But there are, there are leaders, business leaders today, I'm aware that they don't want their people to work remotely because they believe that if they are working from home, they are just faffing away. They are not productive. Uh, such leaders should be engaged over time. They will see the reasons why that should be done. And it can be done. You can use data analysis to say, let's test these and allow some of these people to work from home. If they are productive, after some time, we'll measure their level of productivity and compare it to when they were working 
on site and see if there is, uh, if we were able to compare and see if there's any difference. Identify the gain and the pain. And if we, you are able to identify that this is the gain if you work from home, this is going to be the pain if you work from, 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 from home. And the gain and the pain working on site, you also be compared. When you look at the two, compare the two, then you can take a decision to say it is better for us to work from uh, from the site rather than working from home. But more importantly, what matters is not the people working from home, but the achievement of business goals. Thank you. I go to the next one. Uh, Anthony says, when the environment doesn't support each other to ensure the engagement of employees, what should be the response? Uh, I, I don't understand this question. The environment doesn't support the engagement of employees. Uh, the employees, I want to say, yes, there might be an environment that would, does not support that. Uh, but nevertheless, HR should create a uh, room. There are informal ways. When the system does not support proper engagement, employee engagement activities or initiatives, HR can create informal ways, have an open door policy, be approachable. People will come to you and come and express their concerns to you. Then if you have the ears of the management, you can always as well table some of the suggestions, bring up with facts and figures, reasons, justify your reasons and approach and see how that can be improved. That's just be my suggestion. I don't know if Mr. Yemi Owoto also as a senior person. Okay. So um, I can say one or two things around, around that. Um, let me just uh, add a little to what you have said. And I think I get a sense of where that person is coming from. So um, again, increasingly, um, there is all, sometimes this difference in philosophy of the management or ownership. Yeah. And typically when you have owner-managed businesses, sometimes we call it one-man business. It can be a big business. In fact, it can be a PLC and yeah. maybe the chairman or there's one critical stakeholder that has domineering influence. Consequently, that individual's philosophy becomes the subtle law. Mm. Now, there are a couple of things to do. One, people hardly argue with results. However, results too can be the trap. So if yeah. the MD has been successful over time, for example, with physical work, they will not like remote. Mm. He has not really tried remote, or when he tried remote, maybe one day or two days, he called a particular staff. The staff didn't pick on time. He okay. will just conclude that most people are not readily accessible. Or maybe somebody's son or daughter picked the call instead of the daddy or the mommy. He will just, in his mind or her mind, says these people are distracted and yeah. not focused. Now, I'll give you one or two tricks or techniques. You see, one thing you can do, I take it, I have taken a step back to the other question on remote work. I agree with them that you are not going to do remote, but speak to them that can we do flexi work? Flexi means you will still come to work, mm -hmm. but maybe instead of eight to five, can you have alternative timing, seven to, to four, nine to six, 10 to seven? Look for what you can tweak within what they can cope with. Mm. Okay. My other mentioned something earlier too. You may also say, let's do a pilot. So you can say, okay, not everybody will do remote, but maybe based on performance. So people, I don't know how you rank performance your organization, but say people are in like exceptional, above average, allow them access to remote work. That way, Every other person not in that category will strive to well, attain yeah. that. And because that MD or director already knows that these people are exceptional anyway, it will have mm -hmm. a slightly higher comfort level to allow them to do remote. But if he's thinking about people who are neither hot nor cold, you say, ah, these ones are coming to work. We are not really uh, feeling their impact. You see when they are not uh, coming. Now, back again to that question, before we allow Chigoze Ikechuku to uh, make his comment, contributions or questions as the case may be. You see, yes, I know sometimes we tell HR people that you can take a walk, you can walk away. But if all of us walk away, hmm. who is going to remain? Who is going to remain? Who is going? And 
all of us cannot necessarily be in share yeah. share bro. We don't yeah. have enough tier one multinational to accommodate all the HR within our network. That's the harsh reality. Some of us too must stay and, and persevere and change. However, look at when you talk about engagement, what is the root cause? Is it funding? If it is funding, can you dig deep, deep, deep and look for employee engagement initiatives that may not necessarily require money or require very minimal money? Let me give you one example. I used to work somewhere and I did something. We had projector at work. I got one of our team members to download a very good few. And after I work one Friday, like five in the evening, watch movie till seven. We called it movie night. Now I would have preferred to go to a proper cinema, but the money to that will not come out. But at the end of it, the kind of, so we put that off the lights, some other team members, in order to buy, everyone actually joined us and it was mad fun. I've also worked in the place before, you know, at the end of work, we, one of our colleagues will bring this PS5 and we started playing like interdepartmental PS5 competition. And it was very engaging. We didn't need approval of nobody. Thank the you. TV was already there and it was outside work hours. So you may, we don't have full details about the circumstance, but never let what you cannot do stop you from thinking of what you can do. You may want to do 20 things, okay? But you can only do six. Focus on the six you can do. Ignore the 20 you cannot do and try to do that six exceptionally well. Chances are you will not be able to push it from six to nine. You may not get all the 20. Don't get me. I'm not promising you that from six you move to 20. But you will now stretch from six tonight. Chigoze Kechuku, please, you have, you have, the, you have the floor. Um, I've enabled you to unmute. Let me also make a post to make it even easier. Chigoze, please. Hello. Please confirm you can hear me. Loud and yes. clear, please. That's my colleague from Sanlam. Ah, the, our guard, he talk. Yeah. Please don't send the invoice, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, okay, so I'm trying to make a comment on the question uh, asked by Anthony. Okay, please confirm you can still hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so um, he's saying when uh, the, the environment doesn't support the uh, HR activity. You know, most times the business owners give when HR is saying something and you do not understand the business. I'll take it for instance. We are, we are, we are in, a, in an industry where we know how it works. If you work in an organization that belongs to a particular industry, I will take for instance, you are working in an industry and you are a HR person and you don't understand what the other people in the other department do. It's just like you're going for a manco report, going for a manco meeting, and you are raising a lot of ideas, but there are other mind are looking at it like, so this person really understands what we are getting. So it is not really about, um, yes, HR can raise so many lovely uh, ideas and it is wonderful, but there are people in the business that want you to first of all, understand what they do. It is when you understand what they do and you fine tune your ideas, fine tune your plans to suit what they do. They will give an ear because they know this person understands what they do. If the business, for instance, is bringing up a bank assurance program, they know HR understands what bank assurance is. And HR knows where to come in and support this bank assurance drive. No matter the plan you bring in, as long as it's supporting the bank assurance drive, they would agree. So what I'm trying to say is the HR people, wherever you find yourself, first of all, understand the business. Then the other plans are clear. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chiguzi, for that wonderful contribution. Uh, like we said, understanding the business. That's the core. That's the core. That's the core. Aligning all people-related activities to the business. It must be aligned. Cannot function. They can they are not two parallel lines. They should not be. They, are, they should work together. 
remember the alignment uh, pyramid that we uh, talked about earlier. I think there is a comment. There's a comment also from, I think from Tigozi, if I'm not mistaken. Let me read, that should be the last one that I've not read. It has been established that a lot of employees have been employed due to competence, but after a while it is observed that employee has behavioral deficiency. If this is noticed, is it advisable to review the recruitment or apply? Yes, that is not reviewed immediately. Behavioral deficiency can happen to anyone. They might be going through a tough time and that's where performance uh, uh, improvement plan should come in to say, let's, let's have an engagement, let's have a conversation. Why is this happening? We are not comfortable with the way you talk to, our, to, to your colleagues. We are not comfortable the way you raise your voice each time you engage your employees. We are not, we are not comfortable with the way you talk down on uh, colleagues alike. What was the issue? And that also depends largely, largely on the HR person who is ending that conversation. The ability to have that conversation and talk. I believe that to every performance issue or performance deficiency, there is always a way out. We should not always be looking at, oh, it's time to terminate. Not all the time. We should give room. We should document. We should have a step-by-step -step process in place to ensure that people come out of the different kinds of challenges that they're passing through. But if within a stipulated period of time, there is no improvement and the other party seems not to be interested in uh, uh, upskilling or changing their ways, then the relationship needs to be reviewed. Thank you. I think that's all for the chat box, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. I Thank think so. this is a convenient place to call it a wrap. I would like to sincerely, on behalf of the over 60 people who joined this live session tonight and the hundreds of people who watch the YouTube channel version, not easy to come again and yet to make a massive impact. You have done it again and you have showed that the first time was not a fluke. You'll be back again, that I can assure you, but I won't put you under pressure. There is a lot of treasure, you know, that uh, is in you that I think the HR community, the HR family can learn from, apart from. Thank you so much. Not shy away. Um, we, we are all committed. It's, it's, it's a cause that we're all committed to, to bring the best out of each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Many uh, positive feedback. People who maybe were either to second guess their capabilities at work, now have firm do and the value they bring to the table. And again, another group of people genuinely who thought they knew a lot, but are now learning from others, have identified gaps, and they are now successfully bridging the gap. And some who knew quite a little, but now know much more. Even veterans who know a lot are even learning much more. And it's courtesy of the largeness of us and generosity and wealth of experience, knowledge that great supporters, great researchers, great practitioners like Mr. Larry Ojola brings to the table. I know today is a super busy day for you. Every Sunday is not exceptionally today. Yeah. But out of sheer grit, resilience, and commitment, we made it today. I'd like to also celebrate your wife, your spouse, your partner, who actually logs in before you uh, to yeah. join this session, and she stayed throughout this session. Thank you. One, Thank one, you. One, one of these days, not too far from now, we'll probably meet at one hangout or maybe at your residence or my residence. Again, right. thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining. We do not take your time for granted. We do not take your pain or your interest for granted. Please, let's enjoy the rest of the public holiday. Good night and cheers, everyone. Thank you so much, sir. Good night, everyone. Thank you for the privilege. I do appreciate it.